Good evening, everybody. How are you? This is Enrique, oh, founder yeah. of Director of Spanish United. Um, tonight, uh, I'm going to be introducing my team from my uh, from my group. Uh, they are my my Spanish United directors from different uh, cities and, and states. And I'm going to um, introduce everyone one by one. So I'm going to start with uh, Elizabeth. Uh, can you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Hi, everyone. I am Elizabeth Kincaid, currently living in Michigan. I'm originally from Charleston, West Virginia. Okay, uh, James, your turn. Hi, my name is James. Um, I'm living in the DMV area, Maryland. Originally, I uh, grew up in Ohio, and I'm of Dominican descent. Okay, uh, Robert, would you like to go, please? Yes, my name is Robert Serrano. I live um, upstate New York, capital district, Schenectady, originally from Brooklyn, and I'm uh, Puerto Rican descent. Excellent. Ivan, your turn. My name, my name is Ivan Caban. I currently reside in um, Spring, Texas, um, outskirts and stuff. All right. Um, and, okay. And I'm you originally from. Oh, yeah, no. go ahead. No, go ahead. Go I'm, ahead. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, via Hialeah, um, Colombian, and Puerto Rican descent. And finally, you, you, David. Uh, I'm David Rivera. <clears throat> uh, I currently live in uh, Ponce, Puerto Rico. I was born and raised in Bayamon, and I'm not Puerto Rican descent. I'm just Puerto Rican. So okay. Okay, hey, perfect. Welcome everyone to the group. Uh, as you know, uh, this is a very special podcast because I'm going to formally introduce everyone to um, to the audience, you know, uh, my directors who was my team because I'm not working by myself. I'm working with, with the team and it's with you guys' blessing and talents that's, that's helped uh, Spanish United to grow the way that, that it is. So, um, I wanted to uh, talk with everyone individually about how you were introduced to uh, Spanish United, what do you believe about the mission, and how you feel Spanish United can impact the Hispanic community throughout throughout the uh, United States and throughout the uh, diaspora. So let's start. So let's start with you, Elizabeth. Okay, it's 921 here on the East Coast. I'm going to answer the questions. I most definitely will be asking you to repeat them. So would you repeat them again, please? Yes, I said um, the questions I wanted to ask you, you know, I'm starting with you first, is that uh, what brought you to Spanish United? What do you believe about the mission and how do you feel uh, Spanish United will impact the Hispanic community within the United States? Okay. And, with, and within the diaspora. So um, I'm gonna be asking you first, then I'm gonna be asking everybody else. Okay, mission and impact. So it was actually you who had invited me to join. And I believe um, there had been a conversation you and someone had and my name came up and then you reached out. And I think that's super cool. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> So um, as far as the mission, I just really want to commend you with the caliber of the guests that you've had on the show. I think in the beginning, it was kind of volleying back and forth. Was it going to be cultural or political or historical? Like, what are we really doing? And I think when you started the podcasts, that really, what's the word, um, streamlined the platform and you're initiating conversations with um, other religious organizations or governmental organizations or politicians, just everything you do, you weren't really vocal about it. Um, you just kind of sprung it and uh, sprung it on us. And then it became this thing. And I think it, it's just really accelerated you to a very sturdy, solid um, organization to bring to the people. So uh, kudos on that. As far as Spanish United's impact, um, I know James and I've had a couple of conversations about, he sees you as like the re-embodiment or reincarnation of uh, someone he can speak to that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think with the momentum that Spanish United is gaining internationally right now is really going to propel the group into places that um, we never dreamt of or thought were possible. Me personally, I'm also, um, I guess, the connection with the Sephardic Benayanu Seam or the Spanish Portuguese Jews, also of Dominican descent. Um, I would like to also introduce like a legal component where maybe we can uh, try to have, what is the word, forgive me, um, campaigns, I guess. Some people might know, some might not know. Spain recently rejected, I think, maybe 17,000 applicants for um, the law of return. So I didn't even realize that just my little bit of advocacy, someone in Spain had reached out to me a few days ago and said, hey, we're like social, um, social justice warriors, like we are doing that. So that's the impact that I know that Spanish United is gonna have, thank you. Thank you so much. And what, and what, and what about you, James? How has uh, Spanish United, uh, how were you introduced to it? How has it impacted you its mission? And where do you see Spanish United going from here on out? You know, like, where do you see it? I was divinely guided to Spanish United when I was in search and reconnected with my true heritage as a Hispanic American. Um, I believe that um, Enrique is the reincarnation of Enrique Quillo. I do believe in reincarnation. That's a, it's a Latino thing. Spanish mm, thing. It's fine. Uh, Enrique Quillo was a hero back in uh, Hispaniola, I believe. Or, yeah, that mm. fought against colonialization. Mm. United is impacting people and can impact people. Is we will have various workshops with the administrators here who will learn to build themselves, and in return help others to build themselves out of the ashes. Um, I believe that we can help other people with nutritional concerns. The um, host and the guidance of the group of Spanish United has constantly impacted me on my health because um, fortunately I suffer from type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. So he has given me uh, nutritional advice and I've taken it uh, as a very, very intelligent young man. Um, I've also talked with Elizabeth who has a lot of input David, Ivan, Robert, Eros, even who's um, going to be back. Um, quite a few people, you know. And what we have to offer is we come from a collective of different Hispanic cultural origins. And we can bring the richness and what our values are, because we all have very different values according to what region we are in the world. I don't want to take up everybody's time, but mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to this mission reaching its fruition. Thank you so much, James. And what, and what about you, Robert? Oh, yes. Um, good evening. And um, um, Ivan introduced me to the group before. I mean, back when it was like um, Hispanic, um, Lives Matter, we changed over to um, um, Spanish United, which is more of a palatable name. And um, I, was in, I was in the beginning. I was I was in um, I was in limbo. I didn't know what to do because where I live, there aren't that many Hispanic people. But it has changed my life. It has it's changed my life in a lot of ways. It made me think that, you know what I mean? There are Hispanic people who are out there who are still trying to preserve their culture, their, their heritage and. Um, I don't know where they want, where they, where they, where they want to be in life. And this group started out very small, and we're getting, uh, we're getting real big. And even, even though in the past, even though there are times I'm not here all the time, I still read and I still see um, um, Spanish United SU, and everyone's uh, still, it's, it's still growing. It's, it's, a, it's a big impact. I mean, um, it's a big impact on my life with you. Uh, uh, a lot of times, um, even and David's important. Uh, James, everyone, you know, everyone, everyone's, every, everyone's growing. And when I, and when I see that, it makes me want to stay, that makes me want to stay part of the group longer because I see, I see a few, I see a future for this group. And um, I'm, I'm, th I'm grateful to be part of it. Thank you so much. And Yvonne. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ivan Caban, or Ivan. Um, how I found out about this group? Um, well, it's actually kind of quite interesting because it's one of those things where somehow I met 
Enrique randomly in one of the other uh, victorious uh, face groups, face group uh, um, in, in Facebook. I guess that led to a slight curiosity on some topic we were talking about next to Puerto Rico. And then from there, it just became a whole nother um, thing altogether. Um, what do I like about this group? Quite interesting because I feel like I feel like whenever I got into the group when it was still Hispanic Lives Matter, I didn't truly know what to make of it, but I kind of saw the vague potential. But I'm like, this is interesting. Um, and I'll tell you about myself. Um, I mean, I grew up. I grew up in Spring, Texas, just a little bit like in the outskirts, 45 minutes outside of Houston, Texas, surrounding areas. I'm originally born in Miami, Florida, around, um, around Miami, Florida. And um, I don't know, this is actually, this is actually something that, that, like I said, to reinforce it, I found this group by chance. What do I like about it? Um, I just like the I I just like the very idea of spreading a, a group or a message of re, in my personal view, to not just promote and Hispanic culture and ethnicity, but to reconsolidate it into something that is meaningful and is not just something that's seen as something of the past to be so deeply like like something that our grandparents from a previous era would have thought of it like not just as a cultural group that's secondary but to actually think of ourselves as a as a greater ethnicity or pan ethnicity in the way our grandparents would have thought of it like in the 30s or 40s but to consolidate into a modern um, uh, U.S. American context where we're in, we're seen as an integral part of the nation, not just oh we're we're foreigners from another region. If that makes sense. Uh, mm. I I really long for the idea of not just an ethnic association, but to consolidate a cultural banner where it's inclusive of other groups besides one specific nationality that people stereotypically associate one over the other, like it's a competition. Mm. Um, I just, I, I guess I'm just at a loss of words because I see the potential. I think the sky's the limit, in my personal opinion. Thank you, Ivan. And finally, you, David. Uh, so I was, uh, I, I found the group because uh, I'm a passionate, you know, proud, Hispanic, Latino, um, pro-Latino, pro Puerto Rican. Um, by the way, hola, mi uh, Basically, <clears throat> the thing about me is what I love about this group is, is that I see that there's passion and there's dedication. And what I like about this group is that, um, that Enrique, he listens to me. And I feel like I'm a motivator, but at the same time, I feel like I'm a person that gets under people's skin because I hold people accountable. And um, basically, I, I feel like this group allows me to do both. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, color or uh, culture over color. Um, I feel like I, you know, that was something that gay brought up. And I feel like as a team, as a, as a collective team, we have gone very far like where the, when the group just start first started uh, you know you saw a lot of uh you, you know black Lives matter supporters and there's nothing wrong with that if, if they're you know they're their supporters but i feel like i was a part of the position to not make it about that like i felt like that i was like this needs to not be political this needs to not be about black Lives matters we need to make it about us a hispanic first movement and i truly value that enrique uh acknowledged that and listened to my opinion and I feel like we've gone far from that point, but I feel like everybody in this group have, has pulled their weight as of the mm. admin. You, you have uh, Ivan and, and Robert, who are educators of you know, Hispanic history. You have 
Um, you have James, who's a motivator, a positive motivator. You have Eros, who's also a positive motivator. You have Enrique, who's a leader. You have Elizabeth, who's a supporter. Uh, like I, when I mean supporter, like she, anything we need, she's there. Um, and I feel like I've I've just been like more of a, a you know, a motivator and and just kind of like a leader as well. But you know, I I support this group because this group is 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 for the uprise of Hispanics. And uh, this is not just for uh, Hispanics in America because, like I said, I'm in Puerto Rico, and I feel like this is going to be a positive step for Hispanics to one day get protection acts and and equality and recognition. And we're going to see less Hispanics with self-hate and more Hispanics come to self-love. So, yeah, that, that's, that's what I get out of Spanish United. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone's comments. Uh, you know, as, as you know, um, you know, uh, Spanish, Spanish United has come a long way from its humble beginnings as just a small group that started uh, online. And one of the reasons why I started Spanish United is because... I was inspired over what happened with this Salvadorian kid who was murdered last year by the name of um, Andres Garrado, who was um, a, uh, a security guard who was working in Gardena. He was protecting a, a body shop. And all of a sudden, I hear on the news, he was you know, shot by the police point blank. And uh, I know that police brutality is, is something, unfortunately, that is a reality in Hispanic communities. But what bothered me the most is how people on social media and in the media in general demonized this kid that just because, you know, he was Hispanic and of Salvadorian descent, they automatically judged him as a gangbanger, as an illegal immigrant, as, a, as whatever. And this kid had no record. He was working two jobs. He was actually going to school to become a doctor. But, but you know, our society doesn't view a Hispanic face as being a doctor. We're always seen as gangbangers, drug dealers, pimps, hustlers, or womanizers. And I decided, you know what, this needs to stop because, you know, we, we always get the short end of the stick. And I feel that we always fight everybody else's battles, but, but, we need, but, but when we need people to fight our battles, doesn't matter if they're white, black, gay, straight, left, right, conservative, not conservative, it's like nobody has our back. And I said, something needs to be done. So that's one of the reasons why I started Spanish United because I wanted to uh, give a voice for those that don't have a voice and to make changes in how Hispanics are treated because Hispanics are the largest uh, demographic minority in this country. We outnumber African-Americans, we outnumber Asians, we outnumber Jews, we outnumber gays, Asians, all these groups as a whole. But yet we are the only people that have no protections, no representation, no, uh, no, no economic participation. And we're always being, uh, we're always being scapegoated by everybody. So I feel that with this movement, uh, there's going to be changes. I want to make changes by reforms, reforms in the laws so that way we can uh, get, um, uh, laws to be changed so that way they can protect Hispanic people because we are the only people that don't have any protections when there's hate crimes committed against us. Like when there is a crime committed against us, it's not treated as a hate crime, but it's just treated as as a regular crime. Let's say like a, like a mugging or an assault or a murder. They don't put more time uh, on a person that does something against a Hispanic person. And I also want to uh, emphasize reparations because I think Hispanics deserve reparations, especially uh, Mexican-Americans who were forced to uh, leave uh, the uh, the southwestern states that were occupied by Mexico. Same thing with uh, Puerto Rico. When Puerto Rico was occupied and they were used for experiments in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, to the, to the Dominican Republic when they were occupied by the U.S. military from 1915 to 1920-something, and that's when the dictator Trujillo got into power. For Cubans, when they were when they were occupied uh, and they were being exploited, and at the same time for uh, Central Americans and South Americans that were forced to come here because they were uh, doing milit because they were under the control of, mili of military uh, dictatorships. 
So uh, I think it's very important that uh, we get these uh, things things uh, going. And one more thing I want to tell you guys, be you know, bef before this cuts off, um, it says that uh, there is a 40 time, 40 minute limit. So if I get cut off, I'm going to do a part two with this podcast. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. yeah when is, when is well, the part sure. going to be at? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Just okay. give a signal in case. Yeah, I'll let you know because for some reason, um, it used to allow me to do unlimited uh, talks, but it says that you have to upgrade, you know, if I do it for past 40 minutes. So I'm just letting you guys know in, in advance that if we get cut off, I'm going to have to do another, uh, send you guys another link. So that way you guys can, you know, you know, continue talking. Is 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 that okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when are we doing that right after? I mean, We're going to do that right now? Just is there uh, hourglass? Or is yeah, I, on yeah, I see. I see an hourglass on my side, and is and it's counting down to eight minutes and forty five seconds. So, when it goes down to one minute, I will, I will cut it off, and then I'll send you guys another link so that way we could continue doing the uh, podcast. Is, is that, is that okay, that's, no that's no problem at all. All right. So, uh, who would like to uh, give? Uh, give a comment on what I just spoke right now. Um, I guess I could elaborate on something. Um, okay, go ahead. Granted, granted that um, you were kind of muffling because of my internet connection, so I'll try to keep up with your frame of mind here. Um, I mean, I, I will say this, Enrique, um, although we've had our differences and everybody at different points have had our differences and types of leaderships we don't want to introduce into the organization. I will say this, I will say this, that you bring a vision to the group that is fundamentally, in my personal view, actually different from other platforms I see, um, not just in social media, but in general, just in generally in people, like especially the way you try to reach out to different communities whether it be political, social, on a neutral ground, while still keeping it true to a Hispanic first vision is very, uh, in a way, it's, for me, it's kind of revolutionary in a sense, because this is something that, although I do see other platforms where they pick up their community, whether it be an ethnic, social, or you know, like music or subculture. I really do believe that Spanish United could potentially be like a transcender when it comes to modernizing the concept of, of Hispanic identity within the context of this current modern day young generation, the 18 to 24 or early 30s crowd. Because that's the people we need to reach out to to preserve that sense of Latinidad or Hispanidad kind of closer to how our parents or grandparents once understood it, but they were coming from as immigrants or as a culturally fundamentally different where our, our particular group is more rooted in the U.S., but still maintain a historic and present uh, connection to our Latin, Latin, Hispanic culture, but in the but in the modern uh, USA American context. Right, right. Because because what I see in America is like there is pref there's a lot of uh, pressure for both groups to uh, for Hispanic people to assimilate on both sides. Like you have white exactly. Americans and Black exactly. Americans that want to force Hispanics to pick a side. And uh, yes. Go, and, and, I, and I just think I just think it's wrong because Asians, they're a minority, you know, they're not forced to pick a site and uh, they're able to keep their culture, keep their language and nobody bothers them. But for Hispanics, for some reason, I just feel that they just get bullied on and scapegoated by everybody. Exactly. Um, you, you highlighted you, you highlighted on a, um, a lot of things about um like when you said about like um, with, with the Mexicans or people in Puerto Rico and, and their circumstances and why they were forced to come here. And a lot of these people were treated like a second uh, class citizens. And um, 
with all the stuff that's going on in, in this in, in the group, or sometimes you'll talk to a, important people inside, but you still stay, you still stayed part of the group as our leader and didn't abandon. And it is true that there that there are a lot of Hispanic people or Latinos who are being forced to assimilate to a mainstream American society, just like 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 once like 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 a hundred years ago or more, or more like with the like with the Jews, the Italians and the Polish and, and other 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 ethnic groups. And we're forced to assimilate, I guess because we've been here the longest. Asians, like you said, yes, they've um they, they maintain their culture and their heritage, but um that no no one polices them for the for their culture and heritage. Not to cut off on a long story short, I remember when a comedian uh, John Leguizamo said, he said his grandmother, but we both know it's not his grandmother. Comedians make up things. Right. Like, true the stories that make it sound true. He said back in 98 that, um, Spike, who's with Spike Lee, Spike Lee directed. He said, since there were no Latin people on Star Trek, this is proof that they're not planning to have us around for the future. So integration, intermarriage, and, and the, the mobility, and um, mobility in, in America is, will, have, will, will, will at once push Hispanic people to, um, I, don't, I don't know, assimilate to um, white society, even as they maintain the culture, but it's, I don't know, we've, we've come a long way. So I figure with this, there's, there's, gotta, be, there's gotta be a way around this, or like, um, like, um, like, Ivan, like, like, like Ivan said, we have to, um, Teach the younger generations to maintain um, their, their culture and, and 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 their heritage and and to, and to educate them and, and to to do more to, to get involved. That's what that's what we need to do. I think this group has we we've gotten we've got involved we've gotten involved, but we need we need to do a, we need to do a little bit more. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I also wanted to add, Robert, that uh, as you say uh, on Star Trek, there's never been a Hispanic person. As with as with the TV show Jeopardy, and this, I've been watching Jeopardy probably when Jeopardy came out, and I'm and I just turned 38. I don't think I've ever seen one single contestant on Jeopardy that was la Latino. There's always no. been white, black, Asian, Indian, or whatever. I've never seen one single Latino on Jeopardy. And that because we're not seen as, Hispanic people are not seen as a, as a race, I guess. We're the only group in, in America that's not seen as a race. I guess if we, I guess if we identify as race as ev like everyone else, then we'll be accepted. But we're an ethnicity. They don't. I guess they don't want a third group who's already as, who's already established. I guess they want to reestablish their own group. Right. I I I, uh, I definitely agree with you, and I also believe that that since Hispanics are are growing demographically. I think this is the reason why everybody has become hostile because a lot of people see what's happening in Latin America with a lot of instability. And they feel that a lot of those people are coming here from Latin America. It's also creating st instability. Like many, uh, many uh, uh, right wing politicians have said in the past that uh, Hispanics are like, are like a time bomb that are going to explode because they do not assimilate. They refuse to adhere to American customs and we've even been compared to the Muslims of Europe because in Europe uh, they're having a similar problem with uh, the Muslim community from Middle East and from Africa that are in growing large numbers both illegally and and legally so I think it's creating but, uh, but, a, uh, but a backlash but yes. in, all fair, in all fairness though Enrique um the Democrats ain't that great either man like they're sitting there and they're trying to identify us as black. Right. So um, let, let's let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, when it yeah. comes down to the Democratic Party, it's a black and white party. The exactly. Hispanics are just being used as a tool, a crutch by saying black and brown, but really brown people are not getting anything out of it. Yes, the Republican no, Party we're not. says we are uh, like what it bothered me is when Donald Trump had said uh, the uh, Puerto Rico was a burden on the United States of America financially. Uh, I think both political parties, and that's why I try to be a neutral um, when it comes to the, both, the, the political aspect, is that both political parties have neutrally e are equally put down Hispanic people, whether it be us being a stepping stone for the Black community um, or us being a, uh, a body to die for this nation. Uh, um, Dave, David, not not to cut you off short, but um, I have less than a minute left, so let me uh, uh, can't, let me finish with you guys right now, and then I'm gonna send you a link so that way you guys can log in to to do, to do the uh, second part. Okay.
Welcome everybody. This is part two of the Spanish United Directors meeting. Uh, we're gonna finish where, where we left off. Um, anyway, I wanted to uh, go back with David and uh, yeah, getting back to what you were saying. Yes, I do believe that both the, the liberals and the Democratic Party are have not done anything for the Hispanic community per se, but they're a little bit like more subtle, but I believe both groups are bad in their own way. That's one of the reasons why I started Spanish United because I feel that politically, you know, things haven't worked. Culturally, uh, when we try to unite ourselves with other groups that don't have our best interests haven't worked. And I think that the only reliance that we have is amongst each other. I think that we need to fix the tribalism that it is within the Hispanic community because I think you know, we're, we're able to be conquered or divided very easily when we're not united. Uh, Hispanics have something in common that other groups don't have that are minorities here is that we have one common denominator, that we speak the same language and we have the same culture, even though racially, racially and culturally and even customs, we may look different from one another, but we all have that common denominator that other groups don't have. So one of the things that I'm, that I'm doing at with Spanish United is that you know, we are we're trying to erase any tribalism. It doesn't matter if you're Mexican, Puerto Rican, uh -huh. Central American, or you're even from, you know, Africa or from Asia, because you have uh, mm -hmm. people from the former Spanish Empire down in Africa and Asia that are, that are Equatorial Guinea, Western Sahara, and the Philippines, which a lot of people don't think about, but they are part of of the La of the Latin uh, community. You know. Unfortunately, you know, yeah. they're geographically far away from each other. So well, I, can I can I can I, sure. can I say something sure. on, on just ahead. one last thing? Sure. Um, the one thing that I have an issue with with the Democratic Party is that it's their that's their uh it's their place. They are the party of minority. Okay. Right. So it is their place to give us protection acts. It's their place. On it, it, whatever happens in Puerto Rico, it comes from them, the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party. Unless there's a Republican president, that is the only way a Republican is able to be involved in Puerto Rico. Um, but when it comes to the dealings with Puerto Rico or any any minority ethnicity in the United States, it, it, it comes from the Democratic Party. So the failure of us having protection acts is is due to the Democratic Party. And like I said, I'm not a conservative. I'm independent. I support independista. Um, that, and for those who don't know, for the people that are going to watch, independista is is separation from America. Um, we don't want we don't want to deal with America no more. Um, we are very very loyal to Campos. Um, and sometimes the, the one thing I don't like that we do is we're very violent, if need be. Um, and maybe that's Enrique where I get those bad habits um, because of the way I was raised. But I, I believe that the Democratic Party needs to do better uh, with including Hispanics due to the fact that we are the majority of the United States. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree with you. But I believe that, you know, the best way that we could uh, get our objective across is, again, through through diplomacy because again if you look at the past with previous groups with our ancestors you know they started out okay but then when they started to become militant uh the ones that were not killed off a lot of them evolved into gangs and they became the exact opposite of what they were supposed to be so i believe that uh the way we approach uh change the way we approach reforms has to be in a peaceful manner, but also in a diplomatic matter. Like, think about it. How do you think I've been able to come so far in reaching out to politicians and important people? It's not because I was being radical or being threatening or being a gangster. You know, I would approach to them diplomatically, respectfully, professionally, um, and they were able to be receptive. You know, from what I've learned, you know, in the uh, in the university, you know, when I when I would, you know, tutor people, whatever, if you treat people with respect and you treat people with equality at the same time, uh, you prove to them that you're not a threat to them by your actions and by your speech. Mm -hmm. uh, 
for the most part, you know, people are going to be open to listening to you because uh, from, from what I see with a lot of uh, movements that have come and gone, you know, they have started out well, but, you know, when you have people that they want to do things uh, through the sword, it just creates more problems. And that's one of the reasons why we have gangs. You know, originally, a lot of gangs that existed, you know, today, originally they started out as social movements or as associations, but, you know, they got corrupted from within and then they become gangs. Mm-hmm. And then, 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 then they, they become the pariah that people despise. Mm-hmm. It's like people, well, despise, I, I people, let me finish, people despise Hispanics, not, be, not because uh, they're seen as uh, also as a demographic threat but they're seen as violent people and that's one of the reasons why feminists in my in my opinion they try Mm -hmm. to go after hispanic men because you know we are stereotyped as people that are misogynist that oppress and that we don't value life but again that has to do with the stereotype of what the media the black the black legend you know, that we've had for many, for many centuries. So, you know, with, with Spanish United, you know, that's one way to uh, upset that stereotype that we are professional, educated, civilized people that we're willing to talk with people without having to, uh, you know, take to the streets. But go, but go ahead what you were going to say. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it, like, like I was saying, like, um, I don't, I don't truly believe that the sword is a bad thing because the sword has, actually benefited the people in Latin America when they had to use the sword to go against the government. And a lot of change um, has happened through that because the government was being violent, withholding food, resources, etc. cetera. Um, so sometimes when your life is at stake and you, you, you know, the pen ain't working, it ran out of ink, you, sometimes you have to pull out the blade. You know what I mean? Sometimes you have to you have to be able to fight back. You got to show people you ain't weak. You, you could show them that, you know, hey, I am I am a very reasonable person, but I am not one who you're going to take advantage of, uh, of. I am willing to meet you halfway, and I am willing to work with you, but the minute that you stab me in the back is the minute that the blade comes out. You know what I mean? You got to understand, right. you know. So my, we, we, so, we, so my question is, how does that make us different from the Blacks? It, it, it's survival. It's not, it has nothing to do with, in my opinion, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, ethnicity. White people do it. Um, Asian people do it. Not Everybody really. does it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they I do. Don't know. Not, in, not, not in America. I don't see Asians well, take to the street. Maybe, well, maybe. No, no, hold on, hold on. I, I have to correct you, Enrique, because there's one example where Asians did maybe not, maybe not, maybe as individuals, maybe not as a I don't know about as a group, but Asians were con- concerted in their civil rights um, fight. I'm talking about the old Asian American communities pre the 60s, the ones that whose ancestors came in the 1800s, like the Chinese and Japanese Americans. Mm-hmm. Some of them did get involved. The ones that were like true Asian Americans that assimilated gradually, some of them did get involved with other groups, especially during the civil rights. Some Asian Americans did get involved with groups like black or, or at least align themselves in some ways with groups like the Black Panthers. There was once Hello. He linked up with other minority groups, whether it be Chicano groups or black groups was 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 some dude named Richard Ioki who was the supplier for the Black Panthers. That's like one example I can name. And then there was a there was a guy in the twenties that went to the civil civil uh, supreme court to fight some case. He, I think, he lost. But those were like old Asian communities. Now I don't know how I don't know about the Asians that came after the fact, like they're recent immigrants. But uh, uh, I mean, I've had. Go ahead. Go ahead. Anyway, uh, James, uh, Elizabeth, do you want to elaborate at all? I would love to elaborate. Just be my guest. Elizabeth, if you don't mind. First of all, we are talking about the Asian community, right? Correct. I want you brothers to subscribe to either the audio book or the regular book of Sun Zhu. Sun Zhu, okay? His name is S-U-N, 
TZU, Sun Tzu. Yes, he's the he's founder, founder of the uh, he's Art the of War. He's the founder I have of the uh, copy. I have a copy book. of the Art of War. He's the founder I have a copy of the Art of War. First thing about warfare, warfare is survival, but it's not about drawing the blade all the time. It's about resources. Mm -hmm. You cannot draw the blade if you have no resources. You cannot have the strength to draw the blade if you have no resources. You cannot aim where the sword is to go if you have no direction and discipline. Resources. Now I'm going to read some quotes from the art of war, okay? You're my guest. From Sun Tzu, appear weak when you are strong and strong when you are weak. You get where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. You never let your enemy know what's going on. You don't. You don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Okay, that's 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 a quote that you should remember. Appear weak when you are strong, and strong when you are weak. Right now, I'm going to keep it real with you. If you are scattered, even among your homogeneous group, even among the actual genetic ethnic group that you subscribe to, you are scattered. Like you don't have one person calling unity or seven people calling unity among your people. You're not unified. Everybody has different ideals. I'm going to say, especially the Puerto Rican community, especially the Mexican community, especially the Americanized communities here, you are weak because you don't have a single direction. You don't have a single plan. Nobody's disciplined enough to sit still and to learn how to come up with resources. It's all about resources. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. We already got guns. We got enough guns. We got enough people shooting. We got enough people going off. But we, we, I'm going to keep it real with you. What, what is a gun if you have no direction to shoot it? A gun in a fool's hands is a dangerous thing. And I'm not calling anybody here a fool. A fool is the person that's quick to act, quick to anger, quick to talk. That's the problem with the African-American community. Quick to talk, quick to anger, and quick to do something. But there's no plan. This, you know, you set up the aftermath. Now, the Asian community, they're not, they're not quick to do anything. They analyze you for them. They sit mm -hmm. down, they look at you. And then they decide where they're going to cut. First, they hit you economically. So you can't work. The men have no power to survive and no power to support a woman, their family, their children. You take away that from a man, he cannot fight. He mm -hmm. does not have any ambition to fight. I mm -hmm. can't provide for my mother even, for those of you who are not married. Mm -hmm. Take away your ability to provide and protect your children and the woman you love does not have to be a woman that you are engaged to. It could be your sister. It could be your mother. I don't care if you're homosexual, straight. You got, if you're a man, mm -hmm. you need to think about the woman that is in your life. Now, what, mm -hmm. what Spanish United is about, and I'm going, I want you to grasp this. I want you to go to the global level of warfare. We're already at the tribal warfare, where you want to go on and blast somebody in the head. That's tribal thinking. You got to think global. Your enemy is global. Your, your competitors are global. I want you to think war is about resource. I want to turn you into an enterprise. I want to turn you into an entrepreneurship. I want to turn you into an economical warrior. You cannot fight a war if you don't have resources. You could kill all the people on the other side, but if you starve because they cut off your food supplies, your ability to sustain life, you are going to lose the war. I'm sorry. That's correct. Kudos to you, James. And what about you, Elizabeth? Can you elaborate? You. What's that? I was said, thank you, thank you, James. Uh, kudos to you. I wanted to hear Elizabeth's comment. Elizabeth, are you there? Hello? I'm still here. Okay. Oh, can you uh, can you elaborate with what James just spoke about and the whole thing with the Asians and the Hispanics in terms of how we are to resolve our issues? I apologize. I honestly did not hear all of that. I'm at my daughter's apartment right now doing some FAFSA stuff. So I let yield me, the mic. Let me just elaborate a, a little bit. Uh, David was saying that, uh, you know, there are times that we have to use to sort when the ink runs dry. And David, I mean, and uh, James was saying that, uh, you know, we have all the guns that we have and whatever, but if we don't you know, have the common sense to fight our wars, it doesn't matter if we kill 100 or 20 or 50, you know, if they, if they, if they starve you, it doesn't serve no, no point. So I'm saying that you know, my success with Spanish United is that instead of uh, using the sword, I believe in using the pen because I've been able to go very far and growing the group and even meeting with important people, not by being radical, not by being a gangster, not by being threatening, but being diplomatic, you know, being professional, 
by the way you approach people. If you approach people with respect and cur and and courtesy and show them that you're not threatening, you know they're more open to listening to you. So I that's what I wanted to get your your view or your opinion on what we all spoke about. Thank you so much for that update. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. Disarm people, uh, being diplomatic, speaking their language, um, getting into their systems. I forget where I was, but I heard something very recently, like uh, with so many protests and counter arguments, um, someone was questioned, well, you're, you're doing that and breaking the law or just being a corrupt individual within a corrupt organization within a corrupt system. And what advice the person was given is, okay, so you go along with their rules, you follow their rules and you make it work your way all the way up to the top. Then you can become a policy policymaker or affect change and restructure system. So I wholeheartedly believe in um, doing your best, looking your best, being your best, dressing your best, uh, just so that you're like on a relatable type of uh, situation, at least their, their view of us or you. Um, disarm them, create those relationships, establish that, and then um, that's how we're going to affect change. Yeah, because, you know, the whole thing is, is that one of the reasons why Hispanics are not taken seriously is not because we're seen as people that, you know, don't have any, have any ambition, but we're seen as people that are just, you know, short, short temper. You know, if you say something, you say anything to me, I'm going to, you know, fight you. And what has gotten our people has gotten our people shot, incarcerated, and we've ended up dead. That's one of the well, reasons why a lot of our, our young men are the way that they are, because it's like they don't know how to control their behavior. They don't, they don't know how to control their impulses. Yes, it's very true. There are people that are going to push your button, say things to you or try to provoke you. But that's exactly what these people want. You know, if, if you fall to the to the to the manipulation of the system where they just take a stick and poke at you, poke at you, poke at you. They they want you to react, so that way they'll have a have a reason to incarcerate you. So I I believe that yes, you know, in certain circumstances we should have the sword, but only and absolutely only, and I repeat this, only when all other options have not been met. But I don't believe that the sword should be used right away to resolve disputes because look at look what has gotten our people. You know, for almost 40, 50 years, our people have used a sword to resolve disputes and it's caused <laughs> thousands of young people to lose their lives. Many people, many people have uh, have have lost their their families. They've lost their children. And where and where has that gotten our our communities? Nowhere. It's like Asians have been here less time than we have. And yes, maybe they've had similar struggles as as we have and black peoples have but they're not where they were 50 60 years ago and i've said this many times you go to san gabriel valley in california or many parts of the country you will not see an asian ghetto you know that's like unheard of like you have like the ethnic chinatowns where you know where they have like their cultural stuff but you will not see, you know, Asian gang members, you know, shooting each other or, or blowing up buildings as you see in Hispanic and black neighborhoods. So uh, I just think that we need to use different approaches on how we resolve conflicts. And um, I believe that, you know, unless we change how we do things, that's the only way we're going to take ourselves seriously. Okay. I want to, can I, can I speak? Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I, look, um, Enrique, I do want to elaborate on this because I understand why you're cautious of, of why we may or may not, em, should not emulate certain specific communities. Now, I will say this. This is one thing I could kind of agree with you to an extent, but I'm going to elaborate on this. If you're going to say it, it, look, here's the thing. That's fine that we can borrow elements from each community, but we have to do it in a way where it doesn't matter if we borrow 
a little bit of here from, you know, like Asians, a little bit of here from whites, a little bit of here from Native Americans, a little bit of here from whether what, what you want to say black or otherwise, it mm-hmm. doesn't truly matter. The point is, even if we do, it, that's all fine and dandy, but we need to offer something as that's you uh, we need to offer something from our cultural experience and bring it back into the stratosphere of 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 of, of the country where yeah they may we may be in a situation where certain people may not will never truly accept us but once but we could we could pull we could pull a power move where mm-hmm. even if they don't accept us they will learn to respect us where they have to acknowledge it like okay well at least you you people did that. We have to bring something to the table where we're remembered for, not just that we're appropriating other people's tactics. Because mm-hmm. that's the problem. Everybody thinks we're leeching off of others when we contribute to certain elements of this country, but, they keep, but people keep on trying to rewrite history and act as though we're just new kids on the block. Mm. Like, I feel we need to, here's why I feel we don't need to be borrowing others, but exclude others. And it, it's more about pragmatism. It's not really about, uh, we don't need to, be, we, in reality, if we could create our, a, whole new, a whole new system amongst ourselves that's completely original, that'd be, that'd be, a, that'd be a new golden age. I don't think we have that luxury at the time, for the time being. So if we are gonna, so if we are gonna do our own thing, I just think that it, we need to change the game. And the, on, and the only way that could be changed is that we need to reform ourselves and we reform ourselves through education. And I know that a lot of people don't want to hear this, but mo- the only way P- Hispanics are going to get out of poverty is through education, not, not, not by uh, working a job for 100 years and, and hoping to move up. No, you have to get an education. And that's the problem that our cultural historically does not promote. And that's the reason why, you know, we struggle in, in this country. I could understand that maybe in many countries in Latin America, education is un, uh, unattainable. I, I understand that, but in a country like ours, where uh, there is a school in, in every block, or there is some type of way to go to school, even if it's, you know, going through the Pell Grant or, scholarships or whatever like there are ways and what i see that most hispanics do not take advantage of those our our opportunities it's like they don't think it's manly to go to school they a lot of people which i think is like completely absurd say oh that's not manly to to go to college you know that's what sissies do that's that's what white people do that's what asians do so it's like they 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 associate being stupid and being foolish as being masculine and they don't realize that they're hurting they are they are hurting themselves a lot of a lot of people that come to this country from hispanic communities and and i'm not saying it's a burden or it's or it's uh we have anybody has to apologize for it it's just we have to speak of them like it is a good portion of the hispanic community that that either immigrate or come from historical immigrant uh, communities do tend to be the lower classes, like the the lower, like the peasantry or the lower middle classes with the previous homeland. And I think that's why there's a lot there's a lack of emphasis on on education because they think they see it more from a social class thing. But oh, that's not really for us. We were born poor, so we have to die and perish poor. They still think with that. Ecomienda casta system. Ecomienda. Especially in the more central American nations in Mexico because of the indigenous, uh, the Native American population. And, and, a lot of, and a lot of Latinos do come from strong indigenous or mestizo ancestries where they're maybe, maybe not so much them, but their ancestors, not only did they not emphasize education, but many of them don't even know what education is because they're that low on the totem pole. Right. 
it's a, it's a peon that. culture. It's a peon culture. It's what it's called. That, you see that more with the Mexican and Central American peasantry types. And we just, how does one combat those historical nuances, but change it quick enough to change history, not for the long haul, but for in the short term, take a huge gamble and switch switch up that mentality within only one or two generations, if, if not in a single era. How do we do that while being philosophically militant about? How do you any, do that? Any, anyway, guys, we're going to have to continue for another time because I'm having a little thing that says that we're running out of time. So save up those questions so that we could do another podcast. So this is going to be the part two. I want to thank everybody for being on the show. Yvonne, Robert, I mean, not uh, David, James, and Elizabeth. You know, it's a shame Robert couldn't attend because he was having issues with, with his mic. But thank you all for being on the, on the podcast. Yep. All right. Have, okay. yourself, have, have yourself a wonderful evening, everyone. The greatest victory is that which requires no battle. Sun Tzu. I want you all to remember that. So we want to be all remember economy, economical. That's the word today. I will we'll, we'll definitely elaborate more on that in future podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. No all problem. problem. All right.